<laughs> Let's classify that as a weird one. A lot of people are just seeing blue there. Normally, there's a holding image. Normally, there's a there's a thing that says shelf analysis, and that seemed to happen last night. It's you know after 17 episodes, the wheels start to come off a little, and they almost did last night. Um, if you're one of the people who saw last night's uh, episode of shelf analysis, uh, firstly, welcome. Hello, how are you? It is just gone seven o'clock. Uh, on April 23rd, welcome to Shelf Analysis here in the Ricochet Book Club in episode three of this week. Now, if you were watching last night, we came the closest we've come to losing a guest. Uh, last night, we talked to the wonderful Douglas Kennedy in uh, his house in Maine, where he's holed up for the duration of this. And it, we had a few techie problems. He looked a bit like he was in the middle of a David Lynch film to begin with, but luckily it all came off in the end, as show business tends to do. Uh, um, and we ended up with, uh, uh, with, a, with a wonderful problem. If you haven't seen it, it is available in the uh, announcements section here in the Ricochet Book Club. Of course, if you're watching on YouTube, you'll find out some of the videos here too as well. Um, where do I begin tonight? So a couple of things I want to do really briefly before we get uh, to our guest, one of which is to remind you uh, of stuff that is coming up this coming weekend. First things first, I didn't have this yesterday. I don't want to show it to you now. Uh, the book show is back for a new series on RTE Radio 1 with me. We had episode one last Sunday night uh, with Derek Landy and with Anne Enright. Uh, our next episode this coming Sunday at 7. I know it says new episode available now. It's not available now. It'll be available uh, tomorrow afternoon. You'll be able to find the podcast version of the episode two of the new series of the book show on Radio 1. I talked to my Gil Farrell, uh, Farrell about the incredible Hamnet and also um, we just did it a little earlier today. There is a book club in uh, Mayo who get to talk to Sebastian Barry. And that's all coming up. Either if you fancy getting it as part of your podcast, you can do that. You can find it wherever you find your podcasts uh, from tomorrow late afternoon, or you can listen to it on RTE Radio one Sunday evening at seven, of course. Uh, thanks to everybody who was so lovely about being on the telly today. Um, it's a strange one. I've done 17 of these episodes, which to all intents and purposes is, is television. What's the difference between Graham Norton on Friday night and me here? Other than, you know, he has Michael Bublé. Uh, I was on the, the Today Show today on uh, RT1 Telly. If you're watching myself and Sinead, we're talking about these ones. I know it seems so long ago since the spring reads uh, came out, the ones that we recommended, American Dirt and Big Girl Small Town. Uh, and my four at the bottom, Actress, High Fire, uh, A Paragon, and the uh, un real, Unarranged Life of Una Lockhart. Rearranged Life of Una Lockhart? It has been a long week. Um, we didn't get a chance at the time to go down and talk to the guys on the Today Show about it, primarily because of the lockdown. So uh, we were uh, uh, remote today, both of us from our own houses. Uh, there are eight fantastic books there, all well worth your time, and you will find them all on the Easton's website if you want to go and read there, Easton's.ie. Um, a shout out as well today to all of the other Irish small bookstores that are getting their stuff up and running every day. There seems to be a new bookstore uh, that is talking about getting online sales up and running again this is of course brilliant for everybody involved there's a special postage rate uh, that is happening between on post and booksellers around the country uh, as well you maybe saw the article about it yesterday or if, if you're in the book club here you saw 17 people post the same article because they were so excited about it which is fair enough um, uh, you'll find more details about that through your local bookstores as well but double check it if you are going to go and buy yourself a book bookstores all around the country are now reopening for online sales and have a look and you'll be able to find out some more detail of it there uh, Karina is, uh, of course, if you're switching on for the very first time, it might seem unusual to have a houseplant recommend books to you. Nonetheless, that's how it works on this show. Firstly, I'll give you this. Uh, it is, of course, the Read Irish Women Challenge 2020 ongoing throughout the month. Today being the 23rd, I do have it right. A book featuring a real Irish woman is uh, Karina's recommendation for tonight. Karina is going to give us, what are you going to give us, Karina? Uh, let's see firstly what she has. Hi, Karina. How are you feeling, first of all? Are you feeling good? Yeah? Having an interesting day today? Good. You're recommending the wonderful Don't Touch My Hair uh, by Emma DeBerry. If you've never uh, um, come to see Emma at a festival or if you haven't uh, read anything of hers, it is all about the nature of uh, people who are uh, Afro-Caribbean and people who are British and Irish with black hair. It is about how that hair works, about the cultural uh, import of that, dealing all the way back to um, fractal mathematics in Africa. It's an extraordinary read, and it will open the lid on a huge amount of things you thought you made known something about, but didn't. And it's done by the wonderful um, uh, Irish author who lives in the UK, Emma DeBerry, as well. Karina, thank you. All of uh, Karina's stuff you'll find in previous episodes here as well. Briefly, before we get on to our guest tonight, 
last night I was caught halfway through when I was filling. I'll be honest with you, I was filling because we'd lost our guest. And I was giving you a few books that are on my TBR shelf inside that are ones I'm really looking forward to, ones I haven't had a chance to read yet, but ones that if you like the look of, you will be able to put in advance orders for. Even just go, hmm, seems like me. Um, I'm going to do three more that were left last night that I didn't quite make it to really briefly because, again, I haven't read these books as of yet, but they're on my I really want to read them pile. This is by Paul Behrens, uh, who is Irish. Uh, it is called The Best of Times, The Worst of Times, Futures from the Frontiers of Climate Science. does exactly uh, what it says uh, on the tin. This one came to me uh, a little while back, and it's one that I've been looking forward to reading hugely. Uh, Futures from the Frontiers of Climate Science. Paul Behrens, The Best of Times, The Worst of Times, allegedly out in July. These things are changing. Roddy Doyle has a new book coming out as well uh, called Love with a great cover on the front of it. I'm not sure if this has been moved out slightly or moved it a little bit, um, but if it's anything like Roddy's last full proper novel, I adored it. Uh, Roddy's new book called Love is coming out. And I was lucky enough to get one of these as well. I know people got slightly agitated when they saw that, that I had one. This is the limited proof of David Mitchell's new book, Utopia Avenue, which, yeah, look, it's a monster. It's David Mitchell. Um, immediately, I'm going to go. That's that's fair enough. It is a beautiful. The back is also gorgeous as well. It is about a band and about the history of a fictional band as well. Um, a thing of beauty and as well. Thank you very much to whoever it was who managed to get that sent in to me and got it signed already because that's a, that's a joy. This is uh, in the pile of things that are to be read. And again, didn't quite make it to them last night, and I didn't want them to feel left out necessarily. Um, I haven't at any point up until now announced who is going to be part of the show every night. I do that primarily because I used to enjoy, you know, the Late Late Show back in the days when you didn't know who the guests were going to be on a Friday night. Um, and fair enough, these days the press release comes out. I know exactly who's on the Late Late Show tomorrow night. Uh, Graham Norton will tell you who's on, on his show. I used to enjoy the element of surprise. However, every now and then you get a guest that you think, I should probably flag up with people that this person is going to be on tonight because they're going to want to watch it. Um, this is episode 17 of Shelf Analysis. I don't think I've missed out on anything else tonight. I haven't, so I'm going to press a magic button over here to the left, which is going to welcome into the Shelf Analysis world. I hope if this happens, Ian Rankin, good evening. How are you doing, sir? How are you? Is all well. Welcome to the program. This is am... Edinburgh calling. Edinburgh calling. What are the votes of the Edinburgh jury? Good evening and welcome <laughs> yeah, to you. Yeah. How are you? This is du point <laughs> for the Irish entry. We will get there. Firstly, before we, we get into anything else, um, I feel slightly bad because I may be slightly responsible for Facebook claiming that you're not you. Is this true? I read the story today. Well, I, I mean, it happened a, a few weeks ago. I mean, because you said I had to be on Facebook for us to do this conversation, I joined Facebook and about five minutes later, they put me into touch. They said I wasn't me. <laughs> Um, and so they asked for my passport details, and it really was them. It wasn't a scam. It wasn't a Nigerian prince wanting my passport details. They wanted proof of who I was, which I, I you know, eventually I did send to them. But I'm, I looked today, and I'm still kicked into touch. So I'm persona non grata as far as Facebook are concerned. But here I am, nevertheless. Which, which, which you know, can, is not necessarily a bad thing, let's be honest. Not necessarily. Uh, can, can, just if anybody is watching from Facebook anywhere, that's Ian Rankin. <laughs> he's, the real, he's the real person. Can I, can I, you, you, yeah, you, 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 uh, you have a can of, what have you got there? Show me what you've got because I'll show you mine if you'll show me yours. Okay. Well, we're not advertising, are we? I've got a lovely oh, not even slightly. brew dog. I, you brew see, dog. I, feel, I felt guilty because I did have something else and I thought, but look, if you're going to have a proper beer, I'm going to have a beer as well. Uh, I, nice I, beer. I have a little brew dog glass. You've got a brew dog glass. Good for yeah. it. Good on you. Um, having said that, if we're going to plug our friends and family, everybody we know, this is uh, the brewery that is right across the road from where I live. I kid uh -oh. you not, I live across the road from the brewery. Uh, so these are rascals, and this is their their pale ale here in Inchicore in Dublin. Uh, so chin chin Lange. and salute. Okay. Hmm. Um, happy advance birthday. It's your birthday next week. Birthday on Tuesday. I'm going to be 60 on Tuesday. And I've not yet applied for my bus pass because... <laughs> Suddenly, the idea of taking a bus doesn't appeal quite so much as it no, did they, three no, months ago. How, how is, the, is that going to work for you? Because usually the first question I ask authors on this is about how they've been dealing with the last few weeks in the situation that we're all in. And, and that's a question for you as well. But again, you know, given that you're, you're, you're supposed to be, I presume, celebrating a, a major yeah. event. Well, I mean, I'd, I'd written lists of things. People I wanted to invite to parties. I'd got tickets for a... 
a live streaming um, an exhibition that was uh, that was going to be streamed in a cinema. My wife and my son and I were going to go to that. I had the restaurant in mind that I was going to go to afterwards for my birthday dinner. I was going to go to a gig with my friends one day. I was going to do this, I was going to do that. Record Store Day was going to be part of it. Um, no, I think what I'm going to do, Rick, is I'm probably just going to have a quiet night in. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, and and I, I wonder, given that you've just listed off all those things, are you a little bit like me? Because it's, it's my birthday in about in two weeks time on the 7th of May. and I'm, on, I'm turning 47. It's nothing important. It's not a big one. But I've managed to stretch it out to at least a birthday week at this stage. Mm -hmm. And I think the older I get, the longer it's stretching out. I'm hoping to have a birthday month by the time I get to, you know, to, to a little bit further on. Well, that's what I was doing. I was stretching it out with kind of gigs with friends and listening nights with friends and record store day with other friends and parties and dinner and all sorts. Um, and maybe we'll put that on ice and we'll try it again uh, later in the year, if and when we come out of this uh, lockdown. But it's been great. I mean, in some ways it's been amazing because I was writing a book. And so I would have been in lockdown anyway. Mm -hmm. um, the only frustrating thing for me was that we've got a house way up on the north coast, past Inverness, little fishing village, house on the shore, and I, that's usually where I go to write. And I'll just lock myself away. There's no mobile phone signal. There's no TV. Um, and I just write and write and write. And, of course, I couldn't do that this year for the edits. I'd got some of the book written, most of the book written before the lockdown. But it's been edited here in my wee uh, office in Edinburgh. Um, and it's sitting next to me. I sent it to my editor yesterday, finished it yesterday, and sent it to my editor and sent it to my agent today. So as far as I'm concerned, that's it. Well, now that we're here, we, we may as well talk about it. I can't find an official cover for it as of yet, because it's not out until, what, no. October? When, when, when it's yeah, I've not, the, it's not, I've not seen a cover. There is no cover. That's as, as much as we've got at the moment. Maybe if you can, tell us a little bit about a song for the dark times and, and, and as much as you can tell us at this early stage. Uh, well, it was, it was begun back in October. I started getting the idea for it in October last year. And the title of Song for the Dark Times, I thought, yeah, these are very dark times that the human race is going through at the moment. These are very dark times. I'm going to call it a Song for the Dark Times, which is a, a misquotation from Bertolt Brecht. And gee, what did I know? Those were the good times. <laughs> and the dark times were still ahead of us. Um, so uh, Rebus, um, in retirement still, my detective, gets a very early morning phone call from his daughter who's um, all grown up and has a kid and she lives on the far north coast of Scotland and her partner has disappeared. And the police think she has something to do with it because she was having a bit of a fling and this was discovered by her partner. Uh, so Rebus heads north. Rebus goes, you know, as he's wont to do, like a bull in a china shop, jumps in the car, drives north to try and help her. Um, but because he's got some health issues, he finds that he needs some help as well. Um, so there's that playing out in the far north of Scotland. So it was basically taking me out of my comfort zone and taking him out of his comfort zone geographically and reconnecting him with his daughter in a way that I haven't done really since book one, which was published in 1987 when she was 12 years old or something. 1987, that's an extraordinary length of time to continue, yeah. I mean, as an author, to continue an interest in a single character, you know, albeit on and off, but that's, 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 that's a, an extraordinary devotion to one character. Well, I think the thing is that I decided early on that he would age more or less in real time. And so when I sit down to write a book, he's changed, his life has changed. You know, he's, he's, he's he retired, 17 books in, he retired, but then I found a way to bring him back as a kind of semi-civilian working for the police, and now he's properly retired, um, and he's got health issues, he's got COPD, we used to call it emphysema, so stairs are an issue for him, he lives in a second floor tenement, so that's a problem, he's now got a dog that I gave him a couple of books ago, his life keeps changing, and that makes it, keeps me on my toes, and it keeps him interesting to me, because I'm not writing about the same character twice. We're going to uh, ask you to uh, have a look at three books from from your own shelves. I'm kind of thrilled that you are in the room that you're in because earlier on when we were doing the the setup for this, you actually went for a wander around the room. And I am going to ask you to do that later, maybe when we finish off. But you, you've chosen three books to recommend. Uh, the criteria are the same every night. It could be absolutely anything. Uh, yeah. What did you end up going for? Okay, well, here are my three. Uh, number eight is Edna O'Brien. Uh, her new book, Girl, which is amazing. If I'm writing as well as that when I'm her age, it'll be a blessing, I'll tell you. She's a fantastic writer and always has been. Uh, what else have I got here? I've got, oh, Brian McGilloway, 
The Last Crossing, which is fantastic. It was supposed to be published on the 2nd of April. I don't know if they stuck to that or not. Um, it's, he's a fantastic Irish writer. This is a book about the Troubles, but it's not about the Troubles. It's about deception, a love affair that comes and goes, people growing old, putting enmities behind them. It's an amazing um, novel. That's my two Irish novels. Uh, mm -hmm. James Elroy, Blood in the Moon. This was the first book of his I read. It's a really scabby paperback. Um, and he has kind of scribbled all over it. Yeah, he scribbled all over it in his in, in estimable style. Uh, an actual James Elroy scribble. He's the one who's done that on his own book. Yeah, I know he wrote in the front. It's the actor James Woods in the film version. But inside it, he did, let me see, to Ian Rankin, uh, you are the Scottish Elroy. Nice one to have. You need to Oh, wait, I told him to say that basically. Um, I've got a book I stole from a friend of mine uh, at school, A Clockwork Orange, which I read when I was about 14. I wasn't old enough to go and see the movie. And I've got a little quote here. I've written on it in 1980 when I was uh, 19. This is one of my favourite novels. I've just reread it for about the seventh time. I learned a lot about writing from that book. Right, let's get to it. Uh, it's a history of how I became a crime writer, really. I'm doing mm -hmm. it in three books. Okay, there's five here. I'm doing it in three books. Um, Miss Jean Brodie. Uh, Muriel Spark was hugely important to me. Uh, I was at university, first member of my family to go to university, studying English because that was the only subject I was any good at, and I just loved reading and writing. Um, and uh, I applied to do a PhD, and I applied to do a PhD in the novels of Muriel Spark. And they agreed to let me do it, and they gave me three years of funding. So those three years of funding, I decided not to do my PhD on Muriel Spark, uh, but to write three novels. And I wrote three novels in, in, that, in those three years, and the third of those novels was the first Rebus novel. Mm -hmm. So it was thanks to Miss Jean Brodie and Muriel Spark that I became a writer, really. And I did learn, I mean, I love her books. I've got all of her books. And I think she was an extraordinary uh, writer, a great international writer, a great internationalist, a great stylist, and everything else. But she, Miss Jean Brodie, um, the character, is descended from William Brodie, who's a real-life Edinburgh character who was gentleman by day, thief by night, and was eventually hanged on a scaffold he had made because he was a carpenter. In okay. Robert Louis Stevenson's childhood home, uh, childhood bedroom, was a wardrobe made by this guy, William Brodie, and Stevenson's nursemaid would tell him the story of this guy who was good and evil contained in the same person. So... We get from Miss Jean Brodie to Deacon William Brodie to Jekyll and Hyde, Robert Louis Stevenson's most famous book about good and evil and why good people sometimes do terrible things. That was part of my investigation into good and evil, which took me then to confessions, memoirs and confessions of a justified sinner um, by James Hogg, which is an extraordinary, one of the first serial killer novels. It's a novel about a religious zealot, a young guy who's persuaded by a charismatic stranger that because he is going to heaven, whatever happens, he can kill people in this life. And he does, up to and including killing his brother. And we're never sure if the charismatic stranger is a figment of his favoured religious imagination, uh, or it's a devil incarnate, or it's a psychopath. That's left up to the reader to decide. So the Muriel Spark, the... William Brodie, The Jekyll and Hyde, The Confessions of a Justified Sinner, I thought I want to write about these very dark subjects. I want to write about good and evil. There wasn't much in the way of Scottish crime fiction at that time, but there was this, uh, which is William McIlvanny's Laidlaw. William McIlvanny was a fantastic literary novelist. Um, he was a poet, he was an essayist, but he wrote three really good crime novels. Um, and this one came out in 79, I think I came across it in the early 80s. And round about the same time as I decided that I wanted to be a crime writer, Willie McIlvanny made it okay for me to write crime fiction. Because if he wrote it, it must be literature. And the other guy who did that for me was this guy Dickens. So we've got Bleak House, which I read at roughly the same time. And I reread it pretty much every two or three years. It's a crime novel. It's got one of the first detectives in fiction in it. It's a mystery. It's got a murder. It's got intrigue, it's got comedy, it's got satire, it's got a huge panoply of English life. It's all about London, it's about politics, it's about culture, it's a satire about culture and a satire about politics. All human life is there um, in a very readable form. And I thought, yeah, Dickens is a crime writer. Michael Vanny's a crime writer. Even Muriel Spark, God bless her, wrote a crime novel, The Driver's Seat. Um, James Hogg wrote a serial killer novel and Jekyll and Hyde is a crime novel. 
these are all crime novels and it's okay for me to be a crime writer. Thank you very much. I'm going now. <laughs> it's almost as if I've been in the midst of a lecture about your life that I wasn't <laughs> expecting. If I die now, you've got the That's, obituary. It's been a good ending, right? Yeah, it's been cool. Um, I don't know where to go from, from there off the back of that. I mean, my, my thought as you're doing those over the course of those is, did you feel though you wanted to be a crime writer, that it needed to have some sort of, as you've said, you said there's there, some sort of literary worth as well. Did you need to feel like it belonged with a foot in both camps before you thought this can be something that, I, that I'm going to do? I think so. I think so. I mean, I, I thought, I wanted to write about Edinburgh. I mean, I was, you know, I'd, I'd spent seven years at university doing English literature, doing literature. Um, and I was immersed in all the cultural theory of the time, all the critical theory of the time, deconstruction and semiotics and all of that. And the first Rebus novel is a playful novel. It's a very dark novel. But the the, 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 kind of, the catching of the killer at the end revolves around a professor of English at Edinburgh University who's cracked a code that Rebus can't see. So it's all about, it's all about um, puzzles. I mean, the word Rebus, a Rebus is a picture puzzle. And Rebus in that first book is being sent picture puzzles. I thought that was going to be the only book I was going to write with this guy. So I gave him this weird name, Rebus, um, which I'd never come across before because it means puzzle, you've got Inspector Morse, now you've got Inspector Puzzle. Um, and yeah, I packed it all in. I thought this is a novel about the dark side of Edinburgh, the fact that Edinburgh very much still is a, a Jekyll and Hyde city. We know that all cities are Jekyll and Hyde cities. They have their cultural glittering lights and their, their academe and their museums and their libraries and everything else, but there's dark stuff happening in every city. But Edinburgh, it's almost built into the stonework. It, these two cities, the old town, the new town, the Jekyll and the Hyde, the rational and the irrational. Stevenson himself, Robert Louis Stevenson, grew up in the rational new town. Um, and he was expected to become a lawyer, but he was attracted to the dark side. He was attracted to the old town, which was full of pimps, prostitutes, vagabonds, and drug addicts. And hey, so was I. Mm -hmm. um, I thought there's a, lot, there's, a, there's a lot of material there, and I want to show the world. This is pre-train spotting. Mm -hmm. I want to show the world that there was more to Edinburgh than bagpipes in a castle. Yeah, because I, I will say that I'm, I'm ashamed that I've only ever been to Edinburgh once. It, it was an immensely enjoyable few days. We chose to go uh, in the middle of winter as well, between Christmas. <laughs> so, you know, there weren't a lot of people around, and but there were a lot of, you know, fine hostelries to be had. And there, it was snowing while we were there. And it was uh, it, it was extraordinary. And you kind of just made me, reminded me of how much I, I enjoy Edinburgh as, as a place to be. Um, i I got questions coming in on the side here, which I want to ask you as well from, from other people too. Des says, I'd love to ask Ian what music he's listening to during the lockdown and was there a soundtrack to the new novel oh i love talking about music let's talk about music a little bit yeah i mean uh, over in the corner um is a, a little hi-fi i've got a small hi-fi here with a couple a little pair of small speakers when i'm writing when i'm editing it has to be instrumental music that i listen to and i pretty much listen to the same stuff over and over again so this time there was a lot of brian eno ambient electronica there was some Boards of Canada, kind of Scottish electronica band. Uh, there was some classical uh, Tangerine Dream were in the mix somewhere. Oh, yeah. Nice. Oh, yeah. Um, and although it has lyrics, and usually I can't listen to... If, it, if something's got lyrics, I listen to the lyrics and I'm not writing. Um, but uh, because I can't really make out what, what the singer is singing, uh, some Cocteau twins mm. in the mix as well. Um, and yeah, the lockdown is really frustrating because I do buy a lot of physical records and vinyl and CDs. I much prefer that medium to downloads. But during the lockdown, I've been, you know, reliant on buying downloads. Um, and I mean, what was the last thing I bought? I don't know. I bought a couple of things before the lockdown, but I honestly can't remember what they were. Um, so yeah. Oh, I know what I got. Isabel Campbell. She used to be in Bell and Sebastian for a short time. She's now a solo artist. And her new solo album is just gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. And you need something to chill you out. Try and get hold of Visible Campbell's new album. I love that we're getting music recommendations as well as book ones on this one as well. Yeah. Uh, Eric says, can I ask, one of the best relationships in the Rebus series is between him and Big Jer. Had that always been the plan to have that thorn in Rebus' side throughout, or did it progress over time? Uh, yeah, thanks. No, he, he just popped into my head. I needed, it was book three, I think. And I needed Rebus to go to Glasgow because there was something in Glasgow was a clue I needed him to get. I thought, what, why would he go to Glasgow? Oh, he's given evidence in a trial. Okay, who's he given evidence against? I don't know, a Glasgow gangster. So in that first incarnation, Cafferty was a Glasgow gangster. 
and he just got under my skin. And a few books later, I decided I, I could do something with him. He's like the devil. He's almost like the character in Justified Sinner, the devil who's whispering in Rebus's ear, you know, cross the line and keep crossing the line, you know, embrace the dark side. Um, mm. What I forgot was that he was a Glasgow gangster and I made him an Edinburgh gangster. So he's got two completely different backstories in the books, depending on which books you read. He's either mm -hmm. born and brought up in Glasgow or born and brought up in Edinburgh. Who knew? Um, and I just found there was more and more I could do with him. And I, I really enjoy when he enters a book. Um, he does suck a lot of the oxygen out of the room when he enters a room. So when he and Rebus are on screen, as it were, in a scene, all the other characters disappear, which is a bit frustrating for me. I would like the other characters to be a bit more forceful. But they're just, there's just this yin and yang between Rebus and Cafferty. Um, not giving too much away, but in the new book, I keep looking this way because the manuscript is sitting over there of the new book. They don't actually physically meet. Please fact, give as much as you I want to. I don't, I don't think they even talk. I don't think Rebus and Cafferty talk to each other in this book. Cafferty is in this book, but because a lot of the story takes place up north, there's, a, there's a kind of two strands. One strand is Rebus and his daughter up in the far north and her missing partner. One strand is a student who's been killed in Edinburgh. And so the Edinburgh cops, Siobhan Clark and Malcolm Fox, are, are dealing with that. And that brings them into Cafferty's orbit. So they're the ones dealing with Cafferty in this book. I've got two things. I also appear to have become a conduit between you and other Irish authors. The wonderful Liz Newton, the previous guest uh, here yeah. on Shell Plaza, says, Hi, Ian. Thanks for the support. Happy big birthday soon. Rebus must live, exclamation mark, kiss. Uh -huh. Well, he must live and he must die. I mean, he can't go on forever. Um, nobody does. Uh, but, you know, Liz, being a novelist, will know that even after the novelist dies, doesn't mean to say their character can't be reincarnated. We're still reading about Sherlock Holmes, for goodness sake. Um, so maybe in the future, when I'm no longer here, somebody can bring Rebus back to life. I'm trying to keep him going as long as I can, but the COPD is definitely an issue. He's getting old. He's in his late 60s now, um, in my head. I mean, in, in real life, he'd probably be in his mid-70s, but I'm, I've am just stopped the clock ever so slightly. Um, and yeah, Liz is a great Irish writer. I love her books. Lots of twists and turns. I can't do that thing. as this thing that a lot of writers, not a lot of writers, some writers do really well, which is this, you know, twists and turns and stuff. Um, I, I start a book not knowing where the book's going to go. So I don't plan what's going to happen in the book. And the book surprises me. And it, it, it has a shape that I'm unaware of until I'm actually quite a long way into it. Um, so in this book, I had no idea what Rebus would find when he went north. I had no idea who the killer was, if somebody died. I had no idea what was happening in Edinburgh, etc., etc. And the book told me as I went. And so the books aren't structured, per se, so it's very hard to put in the twists and turns and the sudden turnarounds and reversals that you get in a lot of great psychede um, psychedelic psychological <laughs> thrillers. Having said that, as somebody who's interviewed Liz more, more than once, she'll tell you that she doesn't plot anything either. And pretty much exactly the same thing happens when she writes, <laughs> as you just described there. I, I did a, an interview earlier um, today with Sebastian Barry. He's on a future episode of The Book Show on, on Radio One. He asked me to send you his love. And he also asked me, do you remember the night that the two of you read when all the lights went out? We didn't read. Um, what happened was it was the James Tate Black Memorial Prize, uh, which is officiated by the University of Edinburgh. It's the oldest book prize, literary prize in the world. Um, and he won it. And the shortlisted authors were in this tent at the Edinburgh Book Festival, about 400 people there, um, middle of August, and suddenly the generator failed and the lights went out and there was no sound. The mics wouldn't work. So I was bellowing from the stage because I was the MC. I was in charge of presenting the prizes. And the sound engineer found a small torch, a teeny, teeny, tiny little pen light torch. Um, and I announced the winner uh, and he came up to read and he got his book out. And I sort of stood over his shoulder with his torch, trying to keep tabs on the book. But he reads in this kind of very frenetic, excited way. And, he's, and I'm behind him like this with a torch and he's in the front. And, he's got bop, 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 bop. and it must have looked like the most ridiculous tangle two grown men have ever done in the dark. Um, in the tent and so that was my experience and the, God bless him, the University of Edinburgh afterwards sent me a full size mag light torch with the James Tate Black Memorial torch <laughs> written on the side of it <laughs> just in case, just in and case I've never, and I've never emceed that prize since they um, learned their lesson 
maybe just 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 before we finish, and I know you're doing this this on your phone. Can, can we have a look around? This is your kind of editing writing space. <laughs> willing to show us what are you happy to show us about where you are uh, right now I okay some... well i mean i'm not a professional i'm not a cameraman so if i turn this around i don't know what exactly you're going to see the bookshelves behind me these are all uh foreign editions of my books so there's like i've kept one copy of each book in every language it's ever been translated into and i don't exactly know how many books that is but we have to be ruthless we moved we downsized um a year ago and so a lot of stuff had to go that's the hi-fi i was telling you about let me see if i can show you the hi-fi can you see my wee hi-fi? Who's on top? Some of the stuff I've been listening to. Um, to be read, Pyle. These are books that people have sent to me. Um, desk with my lovely setup for doing this. I'm just making sure I'm not. I'm not. This is sorry. Books that I use a lot. So there's like some of my books. There's a lot of Muriel Spark. Um, a lot of Ellery Queen magazines. I used to get a lot of short stories published in Ellery Queen magazine when I was young. Um, and desperate for money. Uh, so there's a lot of bookshelves. There's a really untidy kitchen. And there's framed pictures of the Oxford Bar. Let me see if I can get that in there. You can. That's yeah. super. So, you know, and there's a sofa. I can sit on my sofa like this, and I can put my feet up, uh, and I can listen to music, and I can read a book. Uh, so I've got Giles Paley Phillips. I'm reading at the moment, which is an extraordinary book. It's like a kind of extended poem about a kid who's ill and his uh, mother is basically dying. Um, there's some comics I'm reading as well. There's a play I'm working on. Uh, yeah, there's just a bunch of stuff. And then there's my lovely Muriel Spark poster. Oh, that's fantastic. That was, was a, a style of Muriel Spark. Yeah, it was an exhibition at the National Library of Scotland to celebrate her centenary, and I opened it. So they gave, they gave me the poster framed and everything, which was lovely. And I only ever got to meet her once. Earlier, I did show you the photograph. I've not got it. It's in the mm -hmm. other room. The bedroom of this flat is my listening room, and that's got tons of crap in it. Uh, but one of the things it's got in it is, oh, it's got the table that Muriel Spark wrote Miss Jean Brodie on, which my wife bought for me at an auction. Uh and You're just dropping that in there as if that's not no, incredibly I, important. You know what? I should take you through, shouldn't I? Have we got time for me to go through? Oh, we have time. We oh. can make time for that. Hang on. Yeah. Right. Hang on. I'll switch the lights on because the light here is not very good. I'll go past the laundry, which is there. Right. Let me see <laughs> if I can see this. So. Oh, wow. It's, it's like a wee coffee table type thing or an occasional table. And it was in um, her parents' flat in Edinburgh. And when she was back in Edinburgh um, planning to and starting to write Miss Jean Brodie, it was the only table she could write at. Um, so it's apocryphal to an extent. We can't prove that she wrote some of it there, but it was the only table. In, uh, and since I'm here, I might as well go into the bloody wardrobe and show you the photo of me and her. Which it's a good I photo. You. I got it earlier. Let me see. Hang on. And again, you look like such a fanboy in that picture. I am a fanboy. Big cheesy grin. I had this huge big bag of her uh, first editions that I'd collected over the years, but she was tired. Um, she was elderly and tired. She had a big day. And so um, I just plucked out Miss Jean Brodie, uh, the hardcover first edition, and it got to sign that for me. So that was my, that was my big fanboy moment. Um, <laughs> That's a whole flat, apart from the loo. Do you want to see the loo? No, let's not go there. Um, it, 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 uh, one of the main things I love about doing this series over the last while is that it allows me to talk to people who, you know, you and I may not necessarily be physically in the same time at the same place anywhere at festivals over the next while, but it allows us to to do this and have a conversation like this. This is yeah, been I'm missing Listowel. I was invited to Listowel this year. Oh, I, was going to be, I was going um, to be at Listowel this year as well. Yeah, and I mean that's uh, everything's been cancelled. I was due to go to the states in March to a festival where I was going to get to share a stage with John Grisham. Got cancelled. Yeah. Hey on Y has been cancelled. We're going to have a big 60th birthday celebration for me at Hey on Y. Edinburgh Book Festival has been cancelled this year. I was going to do a thing with Philippe Sand. At that. It's desperate, man, but it does mean I'm getting quite a lot of writing done. Which will be important to quite, quite a lot of people. And on that note, and with your fine uh, can of punk IPA in your hands, can I say, Ian Rankin, this has been a greater thrill than I thought it was going to be. And thank you so much for coming on the programme. Cheers, man. God bless you, Rick. Cheers. And you. Talk to you again. Cheers. Oh, right. 
Well, that's the end of that for tonight. Another episode for you on Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday of next week. Uh, don't forget, if you are uh, knocking around at any stage, you can catch me on RTE Gold uh, right the way on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, uh, uh, of course. And we're live on RTE Radio 1 this coming Saturday as well, between 2 and 6, simulcasting the Gold Show. Uh, but Monday, Wednesday, Thursday of next week here at 7 o'clock. We've got some cracking guests for you uh, on the show next week. That's it for uh, tonight's shelf analysis. We're going to have to live up to the last two. Have a good weekend.